I need just one more note there. All right, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. If you would, grab a hymnal, and uh, I'm going to get Brother David Bird to open us up in prayer, if you would, Brother, this morning. Me too. 
towards the back, number 390. Jesus, I, my cross have taken. 390. <clears throat> to me, this is one of the most convicting songs we have in our hymnal. I start reading the words of this, and it just, I was telling Cheryl last night, I was kind of picking up the song service, and just one of those you sing, and you think, man, I'm not living up to those words. Amen. And it just, uh, this one here always words me. Anyway, 390. <clears throat> take the offering. Uh, this past few days we celebrated Veterans Day and we have a list of our veterans that we'd like to read off to you. J.B. Terry, 
Judd Ellis, Stephen Kreiss, Jack Butts, Gary Boyd, Donnie Kidd, Donald Cook and Ronald Cook, James Stanfield, Jack Sexton, and Ben, ben Henson. We appreciate your service. We, uh, we realize that you folks have put your necks on the line to help this country stay free, and we appreciate it. Uh, birthdays this week, Jessica Barnett, Aaron Bass, Caitlin Henson, Rebecca Massey, and Keegan Bowling. Uh, anniversaries this week, Jimmy and Debbie Sexton, and another anniversary that was omitted accidentally recently is Eric and Tammy Henry. So happy birthday and happy anniversary to all you folks. Uh, Brother Brian, would you ask a blessing on the offering, please? Paul, thank you again for your love for us and mercy. Thank you, God, for the many blessings you have us today. Thank you, God, for allowing us to assemble here together in this country. Bless us and lead us. Pray God that your Holy Spirit be the leadership in this country. Pray God that you would support and pray. Pray God that you would help us as we gather here this morning and listen to your word preach. To walk up rightly, God. To take your word and to do what you say for us to do. Follow after you with our whole heart. So thank you, Lord, for this offering that we're about to take up. I want to be used that all gifts come from. Pray God that you take and multiply and bless it that all the ministry. Thank you. 
stood across with my Lord raised to the sky. Bible's turning to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter twelve, chapter thirty-four. Pray for Brother Dilbert. He's not feeling well. He called me yesterday and uh, told me he didn't think he'd be able to make it today. So I told him we'd carry on. We'd pray for him. So you keep him in your prayers. Uh, thinking this week just how emotional things have been. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, which I didn't have an opportunity to look at anything at work that day. I actually had to work, so I couldn't get on the internet. And uh, right before I left, I looked in the states that Trump were winning on, or Clinton was losing in, uh, uh, that needed to lose was North Carolina and Florida. I looked at the internet right before I left work and we were behind in North Carolina. And I knew we needed North Carolina and Florida and Ohio, you know, before you started thinking about any of the other stuff. And I walked and we I went home and uh and walked in best like. She just looked at me and I said, Well, I said, let's see about going down to your dad so we can watch the rest of this thing and I said, You need to pray. I said, We're behind in North Carolina right now. And I remember uh, looking at her, tears in her eyes, and uh, thinking about losing the opportunities. I don't think that uh, Donald Trump's a Christian. <laughs> I don't know whether he's or not, but he's not, he don't act like it in his words, obviously. And I don't think he's our uh, hero, and I don't think he's going to fix us. But I do think that the Supreme Court justices can give us the opportunity to live like we want to live. And I knew what Supreme Court justices that uh, Hillary Clinton would get. And I knew what was going to be taken away. 
And uh, just thinking about it, at this point here, God's given us a good opportunity. If America's going to be spiritual, it's going to be us. And we're going to be the ones that make a difference. Christians, not non-Christians. The only people that be spiritual are Christians. And we have to take advantage of the opportunity. And a lot of times what I'm afraid of is, is that God gives us things sometimes to show us that we're the problem. We talk about the leaders and we talk about things and those things go on. But it could be us that's the problem. And uh, with all that stuff on my mind, I just it's hard not to have that on your mind while you're studying and preparing. I got thinking about uh, Solomon and how Solomon got off to such a great start as a king. And he had a desire to live right and to do right. He just... He didn't care what he gave God a blank check, whatever God. I'll just, I just, whatever. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you. And as Solomon's life went on, he began to get away from God and got to the point to where he was didn't even know what was good or bad. And the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about him trying to figure out life and trying to figure out is there any pleasure in this life. And by the end of it, he figures it out evidently. But he got to that point in his life where. He was just down. He was depressed. There was nothing that made him happy. He was looking for life. And he'd gotten rid of that early on in his life by doing things that the Word of God had told him not to do. Getting horses from Egypt, getting wives from Egypt, the war type of the world. And he ended up in a mess. And a lot of Christians, I've learned throughout the years, we get to the same situation. Sometimes it lasts a long time. Sometimes it's short-lived. And people get it figured out and they go on. Uh, but sometimes people will just go through the motions for years because they just can't figure out what's wrong. They just, they just for the life of them, figure out they don't have any desire anymore. They don't want to serve God anymore. They go to church, but it's just, there's nothing. There's no, you don't feel the Holy Spirit. You don't feel like there's even a chance to do anything right. You don't even feel like you're going to win. There's no victory, and it's just down, and you're just going through the motions, and you're going through life, and you hardly smile, you're hardly excited, and it's just rough. And I see, and, and you see things like that. I've experienced times like that. And there's a reason for it. And with the opportunity that God's given us here, and uh, I think in America now, is that uh, we, need to, we need to be fired up. We need to be excited about serving God. And if we're in those situations there that I just mentioned, there's a formula that God's given us in the Scriptures to where we can fix that. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, there's a story about Solomon's son, and Solomon's son's name is Rehoboam. And 2 Chronicles chapter 12, he says, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, for, uh, and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. And he goes through that story there and he tells what's going on. And then down in verse 13, he says this as he's wrapping things up. It says, verse 13, it says, So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem. The city which the Lord had chosen of all the tribes of Israel put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And verse 14 says, And he did evil. Let's have another word of prayer. Now, Lord, we're thankful, God, for opportunities. Lord, I realize, God, that, Lord, if we uh, don't do right, God, that that's going to be the problem in America, God. And I pray, Lord, that Christians would realize as much as we prayed through this election, God, that we've got to continue to pray and we've got to continue, Lord, to try to live a holy life, God, acceptable unto You. God, I pray this morning, Lord, that... And God, maybe if there's people here this morning, God, that are just complacent, God, and they don't understand where they're at or why they're there and there's no excitement, there's no desire, they don't even feel like there's a reason to try to do right anymore, God. Lord, that You'd spark something in them this morning, God, that You'd get them stirred up, God. 
Lord, that You would help them, God, to realize, God, that that spark and that desire, God, is not coming from the flesh, but it's going to come from You. And help us, God, Lord, as a people, Lord, to seek Your face and try to get close to You, God. Lord, that will bring back those desires that we used to have to where we're excited about the things of God again. Lord, I pray, God, this morning, Lord, that Lord, if there's anything in the way, God, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray, God, that everything said and done today will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. We ask this in His name. Amen. In verse 14, the Bible says, talking about Rehoboam, the Bible says that he did evil. And there's a point there that you look at that uh, Rehoboam, it says that he forsook the law of God. So somewhere along the line, Rehoboam there, I mean, he died when he was 41 years old, so I guess he went through his midlife crisis. I don't know what happened to him. But there is something about experience in a person's life where it's easy to lose the edge that you have where you're excited about things. And as time goes on and the more you experience something, the more you see something, the easier it is to get complacent with it. Uh, the difference between the first missions conference that you ever went to and probably the 6th and the 7th and the 8th was probably different. It's fresh, it's new, you're excited about the things of God, but then as time goes on, you're used to seeing the, the slides, you're used to listening to the, to the missionaries, and there's something inside you when you're sitting there watching it, you're excited about it, you're looking forward to it, but it's just not like it used to be. But there's some through those ages there that, that you look at that were really good. And when you look back in your life, you begin to realize that you know these were the times when things were good. And I look at my life and I'm reading my Bible, I'm going to church and I'm praying. I've got a prayer list and I'm excited about the things of God. There's no, it's not just coincidence that those are the times in life where you're excited about serving God. Uh, one thing that I, that I do is I go through my Bible as I, and I read my Bible and I start over and I read my Bible as I write the times down. And there's times where I've gotten through the Bible quick and there's times where I ain't got through it so quick. And I can look back at those times in my life because I've got the dates down there and I realize the toughest time spiritually is when there was the longest time in between getting the Bible read. And I've realized through the years that Bible reading has got something to do with it as far as spirituality. And once that spirituality gets fixed, then what happens is you, you've got those desires that you're supposed to have. And the things of God that you're supposed to have that a person thinks there's no way I could ever get to that point again in my life. A person can. They can get to where they love the things of God and it's what they think about when they get up in the morning. And how they're going to work for God and what they're going to do for the Lord. And how they're going to raise their family and what they're going to do and how they're going to try to live holy lives and they're going to try to stay away from the things that's evil. But away from those things right there keeping you spiritual then you're just going to fall the flesh. And those desires and that fire is going to be put out. And it's just going to be a flicker. And there's going to be some times in church where you kind of get excited about things. But for the most part, it's just going through the motions and dreading things. And you see right there in verse 14, he says, and he did evil. So he started off good, but there came a time in his life where he just did evil. And the Bible says at the end of that verse, he says this, because. <laughs> the Bible says, And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek God. Look over at Second Chronicles chapter 35 and 34. Second Chronicles chapter 34. There's another king here named Josiah. And as you know, Josiah was a good king. The opposite of Rehoboam. And Josiah did some things. One of the things that he did is he began to seek the Lord. Over there in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, it says he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, look at verse 1, the Bible says this, and Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. And then look what he says in verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. 
And it goes on down through there in those verses there, and he talks about what he got rid of out of the, out of the uh, nation of Israel there and how he changed the nation of Israel. Now, we're not a monarchy here in America, and so the president's going to do what he does. But as far as a Christian, the top of this right here, the top that you're looking at is your own life. The only thing that you can affect as a Christian is you can affect your own life. That's what you can do. And so as we sat here and look at what Josiah was doing for a kingdom, what I want to do this morning is I want to look at that as far as an individual goes and what we can do to make sure we don't end up like Rehoboam where we do evil because we prepared not our heart to seek the Lord. But first of all, in verse 3, what you're going to see is this right here. The Bible says... Uh, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, the Bible says he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. I'll turn over to uh, chapter uh, 27. 2 Chronicles chapter 27. And you can see there with Jotham was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And down in verse uh, 6 it says, So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. And when it comes to when it comes to preparing your way before God, one of the things that you've got to do is you've got to uh, begin to deal with your heart. And there's a few things that's gonna deal that you're gonna deal with your heart with. And one of them is look at Psalm chapter thirty five. Psalm chapter 35. And get 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Is hold 20 over there where you're at. Psalm 35. When it comes to your heart and getting your heart prepared for, prepared for God, there's some things you need to do. Psalm 35, look at verse 13. The Bible says this, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. Now look what he says right here. He says, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own wisdom. Fasting bring, it humbles your soul. And what fasting does is it, what it does, it afflicts the flesh. And a person who is backslid or they're down or they're discouraged or all those things that's going on, what ends up happening is, is their flesh begins to get into control and it becomes about me and it becomes about what I'm doing and my life and what I'm looking for and it's not about God anymore. And so the flesh gets so much control of a person's life that there comes a point where you have to do something to afflict that flesh. And sometimes it's going to come down to the point where you have to do some fasting. And when we sit here and we begin to talk about fasting and you begin to talk about just seeking God and preparing your heart and think about fasting and how hard it is. A lot of times Christians don't even understand the doctrine of fasting or they've never even done it. But I want to tell you something, friends. This morning sometimes things are so bad and we're so down and we're so downtrodden and it's so hard to try to get kick-started that it's going to take fasting. Now look over in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Talking about another king here. He's talking about Jehoshaphat. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. In verse 5, the Bible says, And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand? You say, what's he doing right there? He's beginning to seek God. He's beginning to pray. But up there a few verses ahead of that, it says in verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat feared. It says, and he set himself to seek the Lord. See, what you have to do is you have to decide you're going to begin. The Bible says that Josiah began to seek the Lord. And you read on in those chapters there, he don't even have the law of God yet. So what he's doing to begin to seek the Lord, he's got to be fasting first of all. That's what he's going to know about. 
And he's got to be praying. That's the only two things that here in the chapter of the kings before him that they had. He says there, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are not thou God in heaven? You know what he's doing right there? He's beginning to pray. And before he prayed, he also began to fast. There comes a thing where he sat down and he said, You know what? I've got to get a hold of God. Things are not good. They were in a situation there where they were needing some help. He knew what situation his heart was in. He knew how Israel was. And what he was going to do before he ever began to seek God, he was going to humble his soul with fasting. And sometimes, Christian, I'll tell you something. It gets to the point in your life where you've got to just declare, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to have to do without eating for a while so I can just get a hold of God. I've just got to put my flesh down enough to where I can just get a hold of God. And some people say, that, say well, do you fast for three years, three days? Or do you fast for seven days? Do you fast for a day? How long is it? Listen, that's between you and the Lord. You know what you got to do? you just got to put forth some effort. Sometimes it may be just one meal. Well, you're just going to sit down and you say, God, I'm just going to put this meal down today. And I'm just going to get off by myself. It may be lunchtime. And you may decide I'm not going to eat. I'm going to drive out to the, to the park out there. I'm going to sit out there. And I'm just going to sit there and pour my heart out to you, Lord. Because you know what I need? I need you in my life again. Sometimes it takes fasting to just get serious with God because you know what your flesh is going to do? You're going to sit in church one of these days. You're going to hear something's going on. You're as bad as far as church is and it's going to afflict your heart. You're going to get excited about wanting to do right with God. But before you can get out of church, it's going to be dwelling down again. You know why? Because of your flesh. You're going to have a desire. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fast tomorrow. And before you can fast the next day, you're always sitting around thinking, oh man, I can't do this. Is this really going to work? What's going to happen? There's going to be some type of a, uh, the devil coming at you with something, some kind of fiery dust to keep you from doing it. As soon as you decide you're going to do something spiritual, there's going to be some problems coming up. You have to decide, listen, I've got to get a hold of God. I'm serious. It's a serious time in my life. I need Him. Have you ever, have you ever fasted before? You're sitting there thinking about this and you're sitting here realizing, you know what? Need, I need to do some fasting. The Apostle Paul fasted at times. And sometimes it's just to humble your flesh because you're trying to seek God. Listen, you can't walk. You're not ever going to do the things that you want to do for the Lord if you're not walking with the Lord. That desire comes from Him to accomplish the things that you're supposed to accomplish. And if you're not close to Him and your life is consistently all wrapped up in this world, sometimes it needs to get started. And you've got to get serious with God. And God will show up. He'll make a difference. I remember one time in Florida, and we were down there, and when we left to go down there, you know, we, we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything when we got down there. And it seemed like there's always some kind of problem going on that I didn't have enough money to pay for. And uh, we just, you know, you just didn't want to ask people for money. It's just one of those deals. But you'd get down at times and you'd have that going on and work going on. You had school going on and you had homeschooling going on. And it just seemed like a lot. And then you'd throw up some bill that you didn't know about. shows up all of a sudden. You ain't got the money to pay for it. And regardless, it's not a big deal when you think about it. But during those times, there's a lot of pressure <laughs> And you're frustrated and you're trying to get things accomplished and you're trying to do right. And I can remember one time and I was thinking, I was sitting there and I was thinking, Lord, if I just had a thousand dollars, I get making this deal with the Lord. <laughs> and I said, that would just get this pressure off of me. And I said, I just need a thousand dollars. I was looking at all this stuff, the finances. I said, Lord, I don't know where to get a thousand dollars. I just need a thousand dollars. And I remember we had to blow out that week. And uh, we were there during the blowout that week, and uh, a lot of times uh, Brother Rex would stay with us down there during the blowouts, and uh, it'd just help him there where he didn't have to spend any money and all that stuff, and we let him stay down there. It's a blessing having him, and it was a blessing for him, and we got to help him, and got to be close to Brother Rex, and him and my wife got to be real close, and uh, I know she helped him a lot. I know a lot of ladies in here did, but I remember during that time there, one night during that service. We were sitting there, we just take up an offering. And uh, we looked at during the same time, I looked over at Beth and she said, oh, we got $40. And 
I said, ah, give it, give it to God. And so they go through that thing, and uh, we're sitting there, and right before that, Dr. Ruckman had said, uh, maybe somebody, else, God said a lot, he said, God, a lot of times when you give what you got, God will give you back double. And, and I know that, I'm not sitting here saying give and you know sow your seed of faith. What I'm telling you is it don't always work like that. But during this situation here, sometimes God will do those things not to give you money to get what you want. Sometimes God will give you some handfuls of purpose to, to help your faith and to get you through sometimes. If you need it. Sometimes you don't need it. And uh, so... Um, he had mentioned that right there before that, and Beth said, she said, I was just thinking, huh, boy, if that's right, we'd get back $80. <laughs> and that night, uh, Brother Rex sang, and during the singing, Dr. Ruckman went up and put some money down in the offering plate, and other people came up, started putting money down. And he's like, they just, everybody started bringing Brother Rex money. Ended up being like $2,500 or something. And we had never charged Brother Rex or nothing for staying with us. It was a blessing to have him. Never, ever. Well, that particular time, he had left some money. And he had left that morning and taken off and all that stuff. And Beth had went in the bedroom there and was cleaning stuff up. And she found $60. And she said, I, she said, I remember looking at that thing and thinking, wow. And she said, I thought, well, it ain't $80. But, thank you, Lord. <laughs> And not because she wanted it, but she was just thinking, you know, the math is just in your head. And she was thankful. I mean, it's a big deal to get it back. <laughs> $60 was good. And uh, she went to the dollar store that day. And while she was at the dollar store, I was at work, and I was praying for my $1,000. <laughs> and uh, so I'm at work, and I decided that day to get this point. I was excited, and I just had decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast. I just want to get God on the scene and get God doing something. And uh, I fasted. And normally during break, I'd go do something. So instead of going to break and eating, I decided to get off to myself. And I sat down and I was reading my Bible and I was just praying. saying, God, I just want you to do something. God just wants you to show up. And just praying about that $1,000. So I get home that evening. And I walk in the house. And I walk in, Beth's smiling. And she looks at me. Guess what? I said, somebody gave us $1,000. <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> I said, oh. She said, she said, remember that $40 we got the other night? I said, yeah. She goes to that store and she said, Brother Rex left today and left us $60. I said, well, that's a blessing. She goes, yeah, it is. She said, but I was just thinking, it just, I was thinking about that, she said, and I remember thinking, it just popped in my head, I'm thankful for $60, but it wasn't 80. She said, and I just thought about it and it wasn't no big deal. I was thankful. She said, and I went to the dollar store. And she said, I said, uh, she said, so I went to the dollar store and I was over there getting whatever we was getting. She said, and this woman was looking at me in line. She kept looking at me and she said, I just thought it's because I had me and all these kids trying to carry them because you always got those looks. <laughs> and uh, she said, the lady went out. She said, so I'm paying for my stuff. And she said, and that lady comes back in and said, <laughs> God told me to give you this $20. Yeah. And it's not the fact that we got $80. It's the fact that He was listening. And that He cared about us. I don't even know what we did with the $80. I don't even know how we got by without that $1,000. But that story right there has helped me numerous times. The Bible says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, when Josiah was young, he began to seek God. And Jehoshaphat, when he began to seek God, it was by prayer and it was by fasting. <clears throat> and friends, I want to tell you, if you're in the doldrums and you're wanting to get that desire back, you're going to push yourself away from the table. And you're going to have to get serious with God and say, Lord, I'm serious. I'm tired of being where I'm at. I'm tired of not having any desire. I'm tired of feeling like I'm not getting anything accomplished. And I've just got to get close to you. I just want to get close, God. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to give out a million tracts. I'm not going to go tell you I'm going to go street preaching. God, here's what I want. I just want you. And you do whatever you've got to do in my life to get done what you want done, but what I want, God. I just want a relationship. 
Second Chronicles chapter 34. Verse 3, the Bible says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And then it says this, And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And hold your place there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The next thing he began to do is he began to purge. Purge out those idols and the things that was... In, nation, in the nation of Israel's way, he began to get cleaned up. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm talking about your life and your, you want to do something for the Lord and you have being a clean vessel. Let's talk about in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says, verse 19, he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And so what he's saying is, is in God's house, which is Christians, the church, there's some vessels to honor, there's some vessels to dishonor. There's some people that's living right and they're a clean vessel, there's some people that are not. And here's what he says in verse 21. Talking about up there in verse 19, he said, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And then he picks it back up down there in verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, talking about iniquities, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet, worthy is what that means, for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So the first thing that Josiah did is Josiah began to seek God. And then he began to purge out some things out of his life. And as a Christian, if you're going to get right with God, you know what you're going to have to do? God is not going to share Himself with anybody. And you're going to have to purge some things out of your life. Some sin is what He's talking about. And to be able to do that, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to get a plan. You're going to have to get some things identified in your life that you know God's put a finger on that He's not happy about. And you're going to have to get those things together in your life and you're going to have to begin to get those out of your life. You're going to begin to seek God. Don't get this backwards where you start trying to live a good life without having God first. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to seek God. And once you get that thing on and you begin to get close to God, that desire is going to come to begin to try to get these things out of your life. And the Holy Spirit will bring those up to you. And they're going to, He's going to begin to show them to you. And you're going to be praying, God, show me things that you want me to purge out of my life. And God will. He'll show you through the Word of God. He'll throw, show you through preaching. And by that moment right there, what's going to begin to happen is, all of a sudden, all the things that you were caught up with in life, you've forgotten about. Now you've got a whole different direction in your life, and that direction is, I want to be close to God. And you've done forgot about the things that was distracting you before. And what happens is, as you read your Bible, or you're listening to preaching, or you're talking about somebody, talking to somebody else about God, things will begin to show up. God will begin to talk to you with the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Your heart will get pricked about some things in your life that you wasn't thinking about before. And then what you have to do is you have to begin to purge. Purge those things out of your life. And get them gone. And then the last thing is this. Look back at 2 Chronicles 35. For 34. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34 there, it says he began to seek God. Then he began to purge. And then they began to build back the temple there and uh, figure out what was going on with it. It says and, uh, when they're there, what they ended up doing, verse 14, is they found them a book. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 14, it says, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried, to, uh, carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers, into the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. 
And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, the servant of the kings, saying, Go, inquire the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. It's obvious the third thing that you got to do is you got to get in the book. And you got to begin to decide, you know what I'm going to do? This is what's right. Did you see what had the fear that Josiah had when he read them words? You know what you got to have? You got to get close to God. And you got to get the right spirit. When you get the right spirit and you begin to get things out of your life because of the Spirit of God and you begin to read your Bible, that fear of the Lord becomes real to you again. And you begin to look at this thing and things that's in there that before was dull and you look at them and you wasn't expecting anything bad to happen or didn't have the fear of the Lord. All of a sudden it gets there again. Josiah began to rend his clothes because he knew they'd been doing wrong and he knew what they needed was to just get right with God. So what a person has to do is they have to just they begin to seek God. They gotta pray and they gotta fast. And they begin to purge those things out of their life, and then at the same time, what they need to do is they need to get back in the book. And they need to get that excited back in their life again. Because if you read the Bible, what it's gonna do is it's gonna get you closer to God. And I was talking about in uh, Sunday school, talking about it being profitable for us. The Bible says over there, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's how you're going to grow in the Lord. It's in the Word. And if you've neglected that, and you've neglected your time in prayer, and you've neglected those things, then what you need is just a good old dose of getting back to the fundamentals and getting back down and humbling yourself before God and getting on your knees and saying, you know what, God? I'm just a mess spiritually. And I just need things fixed. And according to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, that's the way that it happens. Now, I want you to show you a word here before we finish. <clears throat> there in verse 3. The Bible says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, the Bible says, he began. You know what the problem is? We don't ever start. You're going to hear a message like this right here. It's going to hit home. You're going to want to do something about it. And the devil's going to come in and he's going to try to steal that seed before it takes root in your heart. And you're not going to start. You're going to have to start. The Bible said that he began to seek the Word or to seek the Lord. Then it said he began to purge. And then over there, that ruler comes in there and he began to read. <laughs> They hadn't had it before. He hadn't know what it was. So he had to start. He began to read that book to Josiah. The biggest thing with us is starting. Where are you, are you going to start? You're sitting here today and that's where you're at and that's what you're needing in life. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to, you've got to humble yourself. And look back over in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. There's a reason. There's a reason that we act the way we do. And Rehoboam's problem was <laughs> he didn't begin. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14, the Bible says, we already read it, it says he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. The reason you're living the way you are <laughs> and you're in the situation you're in spiritually with your heart is because you've not began to seek the Lord. <laughs> and to fix that, to remedy that, all you have to do is start. Start. Starts with a trip to the altar. It starts with just a day you're going to fast, a meal you're going to get by, just something, God, where you get rid of that fast, you begin to fast, you get rid of that meal, and you get down and you pray and you read your Bible during that time. And there ain't nothing mystical going to happen and all that stuff. But that spark's going to start to come back. And you continue to do that and seek the Lord in a week or two, you're going to see it. Things are going to start happening again. And as time goes on and you keep doing it, you're going to have it back and you'll be thinking, man, why did I wait so long? But the question is this morning, 
Are you going to begin? So I'll stand. Miss Robin comes up this morning to play, and she can pick out whatever it is and go ahead and start when she's ready. We just need to ask ourselves where we're at. And Solomon, just thinking about Solomon, just looking for something to get him excited with life again. He never found it. But he finally came to that conclusion at the end of Ecclesiastes where he said, Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That's where he finally got back to. Our happiness is in Jesus Christ.